The greatest achievements of men were at first nothing but dreams in the minds of men who knew that dreams are the seedlings of all achievements. A burning desire to be and to do is the starting point from which the dreamer must take off. I spent more than 20 years in interviewing America's best known and most successful men. Men like W. Clement Stone, Alexander Graham Bell, William H. Taft, former president of the United States, John Wanamaker, the Philadelphia Merchant King, Woodrow Wilson, former president of the United States, Harvey Firestone, Dr. Frank Crane, F.W. Woolworth, Theodore Roosevelt, former president of the United States. This program is assembled from a variety of live recordings and radio broadcasts done many years ago by Napoleon Hill. In some of them, the quality reflects their age. You'll hear music and traffic sounds in the background at times. But the strategies they relate are as clear and valid today as they were when he first voiced them. But Napoleon Hill's life is as powerful as his words in proving these principles. He was advisor to presidents, mentor to millions, and the author of several best-selling books, including the classic Think and Grow Rich. Listen, and you'll hear how he rose from poor beginnings to worldwide success. The year was 1883, and the place was a log cabin. I was born down in the mountains of Virginia, where the section from whence I came was famous for three things. Rattlesnakes, Mountain Dew, and Revenue Officers. I never had a pair of shoes until I was 10 years old. I never saw a railroad train until I was 12. Later on, I discovered why my father named me Napoleon. I have a great uncle, or did have before he died, in Memphis, Tennessee, by the name of Napoleon Hill. He was a multimillionaire cotton broker. I think if I stopped right there, you'd know why my father named me Napoleon. <laughs> we expected that he would leave some of his money to me on account of my having his name. But when the uh, will was read, when I was at the age of 14, he had left out the entire branch of hills from whence I came. And uh, <laughs> I think that was the greatest favor that anybody ever did me, because I know what happened to the ones that did get the money. Would you mind asking what? What? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. Well, I, having had no inheritance, had to go to work, and I learned to make my own money. The next best thing that ever happened to me was when I was assigned by Andrew Carnegie to devote 20 years to the building of this philosophy. One of his conditions was that I should earn my own way as I went along without any subsidy from him. I want to tell you right now, I thought that was a disaster. But that was another blessing that came into my life. Having to earn my own way, I soon learned how to do it. And long before Mr. Carnegie died, I didn't need him anymore, financially or otherwise. I could make my own way. Carnegie was very smart in throwing me out on my own like that. He wanted me to learn to apply this philosophy as I went along, to make it work for myself. And he said a success philosopher living in a hovel without any money and his shoes not shine and needing a shave is no good example of selling success. If you want to be successful in helping other people to succeed, uh, demonstrate that you can make your own philosophy work. And I think I have done that quite adequately and at all levels. Well, let me tell you the story of how I came to meet Andrew Carnegie. First of all, when I was in my early teens, I wanted to go away to college but didn't have any money. But I made arrangements with the Tazewell Business College to work my way through and took a secretarial course. And when I finished, I looked around and I had an inspiration that has been far-reaching, that has affected millions of people and will affect millions of people, some of them not yet born. I did something that has never been done before nor afterward, as far as I know, in the way of ensuring that I would go to work for the man that I chose. I recognized that if I picked out a very successful, a very prosperous, a very wealthy man and could work for him in close contact as a secretary, that I would appropriate all of his friends and much of his knowledge, and it would be worth a stupendous amount to me. I finally chose General Rufus A. Ayers of Virginia. He owned a railroad, a chain of banks, 
a chain of sawmills, a chain of coal mines, and in addition to that, he was a senior member of one of the most important law firms in the state of Virginia. And I made up my mind that General Ayers was going to have the great fortune of giving me my first job. And here is how I broke the news to him. I wrote him a letter and I said, Dear General Ayers, I have just completed a secretarial course at Tazewell Business College, and I know you will be glad to hear that I have chosen you as my first employer, period and paragraph. I am willing to go to work for you under the following conditions. I will work for the first three months and pay you a salary of any amount you name per month for that privilege, with the understanding that if at the end of those three months you wish to continue my services, you'll pay me that same salary. But meanwhile, you'll allow me to put on the cuff what I'll owe you, and you can take it out of what you'll owe me if you continue my services sincerely in the point here. <laughs> I guess that put him on the spot, didn't it? <laughs> he didn't answer my letter. He called my father on the telephone. He said, I want you to send that boy down. I want to look at him. He didn't say anything about employing me. I went down to this huge law office. He got up from his desk and he came around, walked all the way around me three or four times, never opened his mouth. And then he went back and sat down at his desk and he said, I wish to ask you just one question. Did you write that letter yourself, or did somebody tell you what to write? I said, uh, General Ayers, I wrote that letter myself, and I meant every word of it. He said, that's just what I thought after I looked you over. And you go to work tomorrow morning in the secretarial department at the regular beginning salary. A rather fabulous salary. At least fabulous in those days. $50 a month. But $50 then were $50. Now, $50 is not $50. It's something much less than that. Later on, when my brother and I matriculated to Georgetown University Law School intending to become lawyers, I looked around and made a contract with a magazine to write stories about successful men. Meanwhile, I had become a newspaper man, a cub reporter, and was fairly good at writing even then. Fortunately, I was assigned to Andrew Carnegie, the wealthiest man in the world at that time, and known throughout the world as being the best picker of men. That's how he became successful. He knew how to surround himself with mastermind allies that could do the things that he needed to have done. And nobody, please hear me on this, nobody ever rises above mediocrity who does not learn to use the brains of other people and sometimes the money of other people too. We call it OPM and OPB, other people's brains and other people's money. And it takes a combination of the two, believe you me. Well, Andrew Carnegie gave me three hours. And when the three hours were up, he said, this interview is just starting. Come on over to the house and we'll take it up after dinner. And I was so glad that he said, come on over to the house. If he just said, go over to the hotel and come back tomorrow morning, I'd have been broke because I had just about enough money in my pocket to pay my way back to Washington. After dinner, we went out into the library and he gave me one of the hardest sales talks that I have ever had or ever heard of in my whole life about the necessity for a new philosophy that would conserve and pass on to the oncoming generations the sum total of what men like he had learned by a lifetime of trial and error method. And he said it was one of the sins of the ages that this knowledge gained at such a tremendous price by so many men was buried with their bones when they died. And nobody had ever organized it into a philosophy and made it available to the man of the street. Well, I wondered why Mr. Carnegie was wasting his time on a cub reporter like me, giving me a sales talk like that. It was way beyond my capacity at that time. I was curious, and uh, I kept my ears open and my mouth shut. Meanwhile, he told me what this philosophy would do for the man who organized it, what it would do for oncoming generations, how it would benefit people not yet born. And then he said, now, I've been talking to you about three days about this new philosophy. I've told you all that I know about it, about its possibilities and its potentials. I wish to ask you a question which you will please answer with a simple yes or no, but don't answer until you make up your mind which it is. If I commission you to become the author of this philosophy, give you letters of introduction to people whose help you need, are you willing to devote 20 years to research, because that's about how long it will take, earning your own way as you go along without any subsidy from me, yes or no? 
What would you have done if you had been sitting there in front of the richest man in the world with about enough money in your pocket to pay your way back home who had propositioned you to go to work for 20 years without compensation or without a subsidy? What would you have said? Well, what you have in mind right now is what I had in mind, too. I knew very well that I couldn't do it. Isn't it strange that when you put an unusual opportunity before a person, a new opportunity, the chances are a thousand to one that his mind will jump to the no-can-do part of it immediately, to the negative side. You think of all the reasons in the world why he can't do it. I can think of about three right off the bat. First of all, I didn't have enough money to carry me for 20 years. Second place, I didn't have enough education to deal with these successful men that I'd have to deal with all over the United States and in other countries. And in the third place, and this was about the most serious of all, I was not absolutely too sure about the meaning of that word philosophy that Mr. Carnegie had been kicking around for three days and nights. So you can imagine what a fantastic thing that, that was. A young man with very little education sitting in front of this great man who had offered him an opportunity such as never has come to any other author at any time in the civilization of man. No author, as far as I've been able to tell has ever had the cooperation and the collaboration of over 500 outstanding men to help create a literary work of any sort. That was the kind of an opportunity that was facing me. And here is an important thing I want to call to your attention. I didn't know this at the time, but I learned about it later. After briefing me for three days and nights on the potential of this philosophy, on how it could be organized, on what it would do, Mr. Carnegie made up his mind that when he put the question to me, he would allow me only 60 seconds in which to say yes or no. 60 seconds, that's all. I didn't see it, but he's sitting there with a stopwatch behind his desk, timing me. And it took me exactly 29 seconds to make up my mind that I would accept. I had 31 seconds between me and an opportunity such as never come to another author. I have never known of any author in any field having so much help, so much guidance, given and supplied without money and without price. I was ready to go back to Washington, and Mr. Carnegie then did another thing. And if you don't get anything out of your trip except what I'm now about to tell you, it might well change your entire destiny and through you the destiny of many other people. Mr. Carnegie said, well, Napoleon, 20 years is a long time and I have given you a pretty tough assignment, and you have accepted it. I want to warn you now that you're going to have many temptations along the way, long before you complete your 20 years of research, to quit. Because that's the easiest thing that a weakling can do, is quit. I don't think you're a weakling. If I had thought so, I would not have given you the opportunity. But I do know that you need something to bridge over your temptations to quit, if and when they do come. I'm now going to give you a formula that will enable you to condition your mind so thoroughly that nothing in the world can stop you from going ahead and completing the task to which I have assigned you. I was taking all this down in shorthand. He said, I want you to write very slowly and I want you to underscore every word that I speak now. And here's a message that I want you to repeat to yourself at least twice a day, once just before you go to bed at night and once just after you get up. Looking at yourself in a mirror, you're talking to Napoleon Hill now, mind you. And here's what you say to him. Andrew Carnegie, I'm not only going to equal your achievements in life, but I'm going to challenge you at the post and pass you at the grandstand. And I threw my pencil down. I said, now, Mr. Carnegie, let's be realistic. You know very well I'm not going to be able to do that. At that time, Mr. Carnegie was rated as a billionaire, probably the first and maybe the only billionaire this country has ever created, as far as I know. He said, why, of course I know you're not going to be able to do that unless and until you believe it. But if you believe it, you will. Well, he said, let me ask you to do this. Try it out for 30 days. Will you do that? Well, I said, yes, that's a reasonable request. I certainly will. But I had the fingers on both hands crossed. I knew doggone well it wouldn't work. The idea of a youngster in his early 20s promising to equal and outdo the achievements of a man who had reached the stage of a billionaire. Why, it was so ridiculous, it wasn't even funny. It even scared me. I thought Mr. Carnegie lost his mind. I came very near walking out on him. It was just something that was too good to be true. But I promised. And when I got back to uh, 
Washington, my brother and I had an apartment. When I went to go over this formula, I didn't want my brother to know what a big fool I'd made of myself, because I had some news to break to him that was not going to be good anyway. I, I had agreed to pay the expenses of the two of us through school, and I was going to have to tell him that I was dropping out, and he'd have to earn his own way. I went into the bathroom, and I closed the door real tight, and I got real close up to the glass and almost whispered this formula. And as I turned around, in my mind's eye, I saw the real Napoleon Hill standing there, and I says, you darn liar, you know very well you're not going to be able to do that. Only darn is not the word I used. It was a much more definite and stronger word. And I felt like a fool, like a thief, going through a thing like that, a farce. And that's just what it seemed like. But I said, well, after all you promised, Mr. Carnegie, go ahead and try it. Well, for the first week, or just about the first week, I had that, that attitude of feeling like I was doing something foolish. And then all of a sudden, about the beginning of the second week, something inside of me said, why don't you change your mental attitude about this? Do you realize that Andrew Carnegie is the richest man in the world, that he is known uh, all over the world as the best picker of men in the world, and if he chose you to do a job like this, you must have found something in you that you didn't know was there. Why don't you change your mental attitude? And ladies and gentlemen, I started to change my mental attitude. And if I hadn't have done so, I wouldn't be standing here talking to you today, and I wouldn't be talking to millions of people in this and other countries of the free world through my books if I hadn't changed my mental attitude and become positive instead of negative. I started in to repeat this in earnest. And by the end of the month, I not only believed that I'd catch up with Mr. Carnegie, but I knew that I would excel him. And believe you me when I tell you that I have long since attained that objective. And I'll tell you why I've attained it. Mr. Carnegie made not over 20 or 25 millionaires at the most. The millionaires that I have had the privilege of making, they're legion. They're all over the world. But that's not the main claim for my having outranked Mr. Carnegie. I have brought men and women together in a spirit of understanding that didn't exist. I've helped men and women to find themselves in all walks of life. I have saved men and women from suicide by helping them to find themselves. I have done for the world things that Mr. Carnegie never did do. And not only that, but what I have done has been recorded, it's been tested, it's being taken to a free world, and it's going to benefit millions of people who are not yet born. Mr. Carnegie gave away most of his money before his death, but he entrusted to me what he said was the greater portion of his riches, which consisted of the means by which he acquired his wealth, and committed me to devote my life to taking this knowledge to the people of the world. It was the one quality without which no person may achieve noteworthy success in any calling, and I may add it was a quality I did not know I possessed until it was disclosed by the searching mind of the great Andrew Carnegie. It can be acquired by all who master and apply the idea of definiteness of purpose. This quality consists of the habit of turning them on more willpower instead of quitting and accepting defeat when one is faced with difficult problems and the going becomes hard. Now, the vast majority approximately 95% of the people of all countries go around and around without aim or purpose. They drift with the circumstances of life, good or bad, whereas the successful individuals create their own circumstances and ride them to victory. You can write your own success story if you find your own definite purpose. To compose the first chapter, you need to know and implement the seven factors that are part of definiteness of purpose. The first premise or factor is this. The starting point of all achievements is the adoption of a definite purpose, accompanied by a definite plan for its attainment, followed by an appropriate action. That means plan, purpose, and action. Those three words constitute the first factor. Now, there has never been known to be a success in any calling except as a result of definiteness of purpose. Now, we all have purposes, varying purposes, but they're not definite. Most often, they are hopes and wishes. 
We all wish for money. We wish for opportunity. We wish for love and affection. We wish for recognition. We wish for a lot of things. But uh, wishing is not just quite enough. Before you can be sure of success, you have to have a definite objective, a definite plan for getting it, and you have to back that plan with everything you have. And you have to treat your mind constantly until the subconscious section of the mind picks up your plan and finds out what it is that you want. The second premise is that all individual achievements are the results of a motive or a combination of motives. Now, you never heard of anybody accomplishing anything in this world or doing anything except as the result of a motive. All sane people move as the result of motives, and there are nine basic motives under which you can classify every impulse that you have to do or not to do throughout life. And here they are. Number one is the emotion of love. Number two is the emotion of sex. And number three is the desire for material wealth. Now, these are known as the big three. And it has been said that these three emotions practically govern the entire world. And I don't think that's an overstatement of the truth by any means. Number four is the desire for self-preservation. Number five is the desire for freedom of body and mind. And number six is the desire for personal expression and recognition. That's an outstanding motive, the desire for personal recognition and expression. And number seven, the desire for perpetuation of life after death. Now, those are the seven positives, and here come the two negatives that influence your lives very often more than the positives, the ones that you have to look out for. Number eight is the desire for revenge. You would be surprised at how much of one's life is devoted to wanting to strike back at somebody for some imaginary or real grievance. And yet all such effort is destructive. And number nine is the grandfather of them all. Guess what that is? Probably influences more human action than all other motives combined. And yet the most destructive of them all. Number nine is the emotion of fear. And under that heading, there are seven basic fears, seven things that you have to be on the lookout for constantly, all the way through life. Number one is the fear of poverty. Now, why anybody should be afraid of poverty in a great nation like this, where opportunity abounds on every hand, is more than I can understand. But I do know that the vast majority of my students have to be treated first for the fear of poverty. They have to be made success conscious, and you'll never be successful in anything until you do become success conscious. You'll have to get over that idea of self-limitation. And the second of the seven basic fears is the fear of criticism. Uh, you're lucky indeed if you come this far in life, all of you or any of you, without having suffered from the fear of criticism. The fear of what they'll say. Now, I have heard so many people say, well, I'd do so and so if it weren't for what they will say. And I have never yet found out who they were. They are entirely imaginary beings. Yet you'd be surprised how powerful they are. They uh, stupefy enthusiasm. They cut down your personal initiative. They destroy your imagination. And they make it practically impossible for you to accomplish anything above mediocrity. Number four is the fear of ill health. The doctors know too well what that fear does. It results in a condition known as hypochondria or imaginary illness. And number five is the fear of the loss of love of someone, upon which all of that form of dementia praecox, known as jealousy, is based. Jealousy doesn't require a reason. It can be just as violent and just as destructive where there is no basis for it as where there is a basis. But it is a motivating force and a fear, one of the seven basic fears. Number six is the fear of old age. I don't know why men and women should be afraid that they're going to dry out and blow away when they get to that nice ripe old age of 40 to 50. The real achievements of the world were the results of men and women who had gone well beyond the age of 50, and the greatest age of achievement was between 65 and 75. So I don't know why one should be afraid of old age, but nevertheless they are. And the last and the grandfather of them all is the uh, fear of death. It's the rarest thing in the world to find a person who hasn't at one time or other been afraid of dying. Now, this uh, course and this philosophy, before you finish with it, will, I hope, prepare you to eliminate all of those seven basic fears, particularly the last one. Now, the third premise is 
that any dominating idea, plan, or purpose which you hold in your mind through repetition of thought and which is emotionalized with a burning desire for its realization is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon through whatever natural and logical means that may be available. In the slang of the day, there is a mouthful in that sentence. Any dominating idea, plan or purpose held in the mind through repetition of thought and which is emotionalized with a burning desire for its realization is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon through whatever natural and logical means that may be available. Now the key ideas in that sentence is uh, natural and logical means and a burning desire. Well, a burning desire is a desire which prompts you to be willing to give anything in the world, whatever the price may be, in order to attain the object of that desire. A burning desire is one that you take to bed with you at night, you give it over to your subconscious mind at night, you get up with it in the morning, you eat with it, you sleep with it, you first get it and then it gets you. Now that's what a burning desire is. You may have to talk about it. You may have to think about it. However, when it comes to talking about it, be careful where you talk because you may become boresome to somebody. Now, some of these things that I'm going to tell you about may seem fantastic. Some of them you may never have done before. Don't just take a part of this philosophy and apply it. Take it just as I give it to you. And no matter how foolish it may seem to you or to those around you at the beginning, follow it to the letter. The fourth premise is that any dominating desire, plan or purpose, which is backed by that state of mind known as faith, is taken over by the subconscious section of the mind and acted upon almost immediately. The fifth premise, the power of thought is the only thing over which any human being has complete, unquestionable control. A fact so astounding that it connotes a close relationship between the mind of man and infinite intelligence. The very fact that the uh, Creator gave man control over only one thing, but it was intended that that one thing should be sufficient for the man's needs. And believe you me, it is sufficient if you use it properly. If there isn't anything you can't achieve which you can conceive and believe. If you can conceive an idea, a plan, or a purpose, and believe that you can achieve it, you can find out ways and means of doing it. But you have to be definite about it. You have to be specific. You have to know what it is you want. You have to know why you want it. And you have to make up your mind what you're going to give in return for it. Because nature frowns upon the idea of something for nothing. And the sixth premise, the subconscious section of the mind appears to be the only doorway of individual approach to infinite intelligence. The basis of the approach is faith based upon definiteness of purpose. Any idea, plan or purpose held in the mind in a spirit of faith begins almost immediately to reveal to you ways and means of carrying out that idea. The seventh principle, every brain is both a broadcasting set and a receiving station for the vibrations of thought, a fact which explains the importance of moving with definiteness of purpose instead of drifting, since the brain may be so thoroughly charged with the nature of one's purpose that it will begin to attract the physical or material equivalents of that purpose. That's an astounding thing, ladies and gentlemen, all the more so because it is a provable fact. That is to say that the first broadcasting and receiving set ever built was the brain of man. And whether you recognize it or not, you're constantly tuning in on the vibrations of other people, especially the people with whom you are in harmony. I mean, where your thoughts and their thoughts agree. If your thoughts happen to be of poverty, of failure, of illness, why, you tune in the thoughts of all other people who are releasing similar thoughts. If your thoughts are dominating the uh, control by uh, thoughts of success and riches, opulence, you'll be tuning in on the thoughts of all other people who think along those lines. There'll be times when ideas will flash into your mind that's so negative that they almost scare you. You wonder where they came from. You wonder why your mind would hand over to you such destructive thoughts. And if the truth were known, you are just, uh, you've left your receiving set open, you've tuned in on the wrong type of minds. This philosophy is designed to keep your receiving set closed to all except the kind of minds that you want, and those are positive minds. Minds that think in terms of what you want instead of what you don't want. I think one of the strangest things in life consists in this, that most people go all the way through life, regardless of their education or their standing or their opportunity, they go all the way through life 
as failures. They suffer with fears and limitations, and strictly speaking, they never find happiness. And the reason, if you would examine it, is that they allow their minds to dwell upon failures, poverty, ill health, and the things they don't want. Now, the mind has a peculiar way of attracting to you the things that it feeds upon, things that it associates with. It's like a rotten apple in a barrel. And you can't afford it. You can't afford close association with people who are not vibrating on all 12 cylinders. Pick out the winners. Be like the man who went to the restaurant and ordered lobster. And when they brought him out, he had one of his big claws was gone. He complained about it. And the waiter said, oh, he got in a fight and lost that one. said, bring me the winner. I want the winner. <laughs> now, that's the idea exactly. Associate with winners because they'll do something to you. And if you associate with failures, they'll do something to you in spite of all you can do. write out a clear statement of your major purpose in life, sign it, commit it to memory, and repeat it at least twice daily in the form of a prayer or affirmation. If you are married, have your mate sign the statement with you and repeat it together just before retiring each night. Write out a clear, definite outline of the plan or plans by which you intend to achieve the object of your definite major purpose, and state the maximum of time within which you intend to achieve it. Then describe in detail precisely what you intend to give in return for the realization of the object of your purpose, keeping in mind the fact that everything has a just price which must be paid. Keep your definite major purpose strictly to yourself and your mate in marriage. Call your definite major purpose into your conscious mind as often as may be practical. Eat with it, sleep with it, and take it with you every hour of the day keeping in mind the fact that your subconscious mind can be influenced to work for its attainment while you sleep. Here is a very interesting case which shows what may happen when one neglects to move with definiteness of purpose. Some years ago, R.U. Darby from Baltimore, Maryland, had the good fortune to discover a very rich vein of gold while vacationing in the West. He went back home and borrowed money from friends and relatives with which to install mining machinery and went to work mining the rich gold ore. Now, all went well for a few weeks. Then suddenly the vein stopped. In sheer desperation, Darby sold the mining equipment to a junk dealer for a fraction of what it had cost, and he returned home. But the junk dealer proved himself smart by calling in a mining engineer who examined the mine then announced that a fault in the earth had cut off the vein of ore. He said, dig ahead and you will pick up the vein again. The new owner, the man with definiteness of purpose, dug ahead just three feet and there picked up the vein again. His definiteness of purpose yielded him several millions of dollars. The mine turned out to be one of the richest in the West. And every day one sees men and women stopping just short of a glorious success because they are drifting through life without aim or purpose. One true measure of high achievers is that of going the extra mile. That means the uh, rendering of more service and better service than one is paid to render doing it in a pleasant mental attitude and doing it all the time. Well now, here are some of the reasons why it pays to go the extra mile. First of all, it places the law of increasing returns back of one. Increasing returns. If it were not for the law of increasing returns, we'd all starve to death in a matter of months. The farmer takes advantage of that law of increasing returns, you know. He uh, plows the ground, he harrows it, he fences it, and all of that costs money, but he gets nothing out of it. He has to do that in advance. And then he plants the seed in that soil at the right time of the year. He puts in a grain of wheat. He complies with nature's rules, all of which is going the extra mile. And then nature takes over from that point, and she brings him back that grain of wheat, plus a hundred other grains to compensate him for his intelligence greatly multiplies what he does. If it were not for the fact that nature does work in this way, we'd all starve to death. In other words, if the farmer only put one grain of wheat in the ground and only got back one grain, there'd be no percentages in that. Nature recognizes the law of going the extra mile in everything we do and sees to it that you're compensated. 
There isn't a chance in this world of anybody doing anything to or for another person that isn't sooner or later done to or for him greatly multiplied. It works out that way throughout life. Number two, it brings one to the favorable attention of those who can and do provide opportunities for self-promotion. I don't know of a single advantage that I have ever gained in life that is a major advantage that didn't come as a result of my going out of my way to do something for somebody else. I have never known an outstanding success in my life that didn't follow the habit of going the extra mile, of rendering more service than he was expected to render, and doing it in the right mental attitude. Third, it tends to permit one to become indispensable in many different human relationships, and therefore enables one to command more than the average compensation. The fellow who goes the extra mile, if he's working for a salary or for day wages or whatever he's working for, Times get bad and they have to let off others. The man who's doing the employing never lets off the one who's going the extra mile until the very last. And he doesn't let him off at all unless he has to. He's the one that ensures himself a place. If the opportunities are being passed out, he has the choice of them because he has earned them in advance. Number four, it leads to mental growth and physical perfection in various forms of service, thereby developing greater ability and skill in one's chosen vocation. I can truthfully say that I have never delivered a lecture on this philosophy, that I didn't intend to excel all other lectures on that subject that I ever delivered in my life, and that hasn't anything to do with the size of the audience or where I'm delivering it. I simply give the best that I have got every time I do it, because in the giving of the best, I become better for the next time. And it's only by that means that I have advanced to the point where I could hold large audiences for as long a time as I chose. Number five. It protects one against the loss of employment and places one in a position to choose his own job and working conditions and attracts new self-promotion opportunities. And six, it enables one to profit by the law of contrast because the majority of people do not practice the habit but follow its opposite by trying to get more than they are entitled to. The law of contrast is a great thing. I remember having that brought to my attention once when I walked down in front of Marshall Field and Company's to show window. And in one of those great show windows, there was a display of men's ties, nothing but men's ties. And in the center of this display was a dummy with a tie on, his collar all askew and the tie uh, not straight, and it was uh, not a good looking tie, it was bad. And by the side of this dummy, there was a plain mirror, and when you walked up and looked at your own tie, the first thing you did was reach up there, and perhaps your collar wasn't straight, and the tie didn't look just right. And you said, well, my gosh, my tie doesn't look as good as those inside, so you walk in, you buy a half a dozen ties. The law of contrast. The man who made that window was a psychologist. He knew that by contrast, you would observe how much better the ties inside were than the one you had on. It made it very easy for you to make that observation by placing that mirror there. Number seven. Going the extra mile leads to the development of a positive, pleasing mental attitude, which is among the more important traits of the pleasing personality. Now, you can't adopt the habit and follow it of going the extra mile without having a pleasing attitude toward other people. You just can't do it. And if you have a pleasing attitude toward others, they're going to reflect that same attitude back toward you. There's no question but what that works. You know that it works. Eight, it tends to develop a keen, alert imagination because it is a habit which keeps one continuously seeking new and more efficient ways of rendering useful service. And nine, it develops the important factor of personal initiative, that is to say, going out and doing the thing without somebody telling you to do it, without which no one may attain any position above mediocrity and without which no one may acquire economic freedom. Personal initiative is the most outstanding trait of the typical successful American citizen. And this is a nation literally built upon personal initiative. When you get in the habit of going the extra mile, you'll find so many ways of creating opportunities for yourself. And one of the blessed things about it is you don't have to ask anybody's uh, privilege of doing it. You can always find ways of doing something for somebody and you don't even have to ask him whether you can do it or not. I never have yet heard of anybody becoming offended or mad at somebody that did something nice for it. Never have. Number 10, it definitely serves to develop self-reliance. Makes you feel good inside of your heart when you do something for another person that you wasn't expecting while well, the surprise on his face does something to you and makes you feel that after all, you're just a little bit out of the ordinary. You're thoughtful. Number 11, it serves also to build the confidence of others in your integrity and general ability. And 12, 
It aids you in mastering the destructive habit of procrastination, which is among the more common causes of failure in all walks of life. And 13, it develops definiteness of purpose without which no one can hope for success. And number 14, it is the only thing which gives one the right to ask for promotion or more pay. Do you see the significance of that? The majority of people, when they ask for a promotion or more pay, if they're working for wages or salary, they give about every other reason except the only logical and the only one that's uh, sound, which is the fact that they have already established the policy of having gone the extra mile. That's the only thing that gives anybody the right to ask for more. Because if you don't go the extra mile, if you're not rendering more service than you're being paid for, then you're being paid for all you render, aren't you? And you have a leg to stand on. I remember an office boy by the name of Purdy that once worked for me. Had on short uh, pants, neat pants when he went to work for me. And one day he came in with long pants on, about six months after he'd gone to work for us. He shied up to me and he said, to, Mr. Hill, uh, I'd like to have more money now. What I'm getting is not quite enough. Well, I said, Purdy, what have you done to entitle you to get more money? Well, he said, it's not what I've done so much, but uh, Mr. Hill, uh, I've put on long pants now, and a man wearing long pants is supposed to be getting one, more than one wearing short pants. <laughs> well, I said, Purdy, that's a very slim reason, very slim reason for asking for a raise. The point I'm making is that most people who look for advancement or look for um, favors or look for uh, more pay don't look in the right direction and they don't create a condition that justifies them in looking, which is the fact that they should start going the extra mile and do it for a sufficient length of time to let the employer know that they intend to keep it up. The person who benefits from you going the extra mile may not reward you directly, but be assured the reward will come and it will be definite. The illustration will show that the reward which came to me for having gone the extra mile was four times removed from the act of rendering the service. The story began 15 years ago when I called on a friend of mine who had just opened a large cafeteria in Atlanta, Georgia, but discovered too late that he had chosen the wrong downtown location because when the business houses of Atlanta closed, everyone went home and he couldn't get enough dinner trade to support his cafeteria. Because of my long-time friendship with this man, I offered to solve his problem by conducting a series of free success lectures in his cafeteria each evening. This was announced in the newspapers, and we turned away hundreds of people the first night and kept the place filled with guests every night thereafter for several weeks. I made no charge for this service, but I did get my dinner free. Also, I had no intention of gaining any direct benefit from my service because it was a labor of love. A regular attendant at these lectures was an official of a power company who was so impressed by my interpretation of the philosophy that he invited me to address a special meeting of Southern Electrical Power Executives. Now note, this was the first step in the direction of the bountiful reward I was destined to receive for going the extra mile. At the meeting of the Electrical Power Executives, I was introduced to Homer Pace, Vice President of the South Carolina Electric Power Company, who asked me to become acquainted with Dr. William P. Jacobs, a distinguished South Carolina Public Relations Director and President of Presbyterian College of Clinton, South Carolina. I wrote to Dr. Jacobs, and he came to Atlanta to meet me. Now, that was step number two in the direction of my reward. Dr. Jacobs owned a large printing and publishing business, and he invited me to join him in Clinton with the understanding that he would help me when help was needed. I accepted the invitation, and that was step number three in the direction of my reward. After arriving in Clinton, I was invited to become a faculty member of Presbyterian College, and there I gave a series of lectures on the philosophy of success. That was step number four, and the payoff came very dramatically when I became acquainted with one of the students of my class who is now my wife, for it turned out that she has enriched my life in ways which can be evaluated only in terms of spiritual values of a most profound nature. She has brought happiness into my life which could never have been known without her influence. And it all dates back to a service I rendered my friend with no expectation of compensation of any nature whatsoever. Opportunity generally takes up with the person who first recognizes it. Examine the record of any successful person and you'll discover that he began with a definite major purpose and carried it through to completion on his own personal initiative.
Not a single one of the 504 men who helped me to build the science of personal achievement was without the active application of this habit of moving on his own personal initiative. And let me give you an illustration of some of the outstanding men who have attained great success by applying this principle along with the other 16 principles of the philosophy. Take Henry J. Kaiser, for instance. During World War II, he was in the business of building ships for the government. And he needed special cars of material to be shipped in from the east. And this material had to be delivered absolutely on time. He didn't take any chances. And in order to make sure that the material would come through on time, he put two expediters on every car of material, one to stay awake all the time while the other one slept. And they rode those cars straight across the continent, and they were given instructions that if any railroad man dared to sidetrack those cars, that the expediter should get the president of the railroad company on the telephone immediately and demand that those cars move. That's how definitely that Mr. Kaiser moved in seeing that his personal initiative was carried out. And Orville and Wilbur Wright, for instance, in the development of the airplane, I had the privilege of riding with Orville Wright in the first airplane that the Wright brothers built. They were demonstrating the possibility of the plane's successful flying to the Navy in Washington. And they chose me as a passenger to ride with uh, Wilbur Wright from Washington down to Alexandria and back 10 miles. And that demonstration made it possible for the Navy to buy one plane. Now, before Orville and Wilbur Wright succeeded in developing this airplane, they failed many times, but they went on on their own personal initiative. And Thomas A. Edison, in the development of the incandescent electric lamp, Imagine a man, for instance, standing by through 10,000 different failures, as Mr. Edison did, before giving up. His personal initiative was so definite that he told me that if he hadn't found the secret of the incandescent electric lamp, that at that very moment he would be in the laboratory working on it instead of being out there wasting his time talking with me. And then in a more serious note, Mr. Edison said, you know, I had to succeed because I finally ran out of things that wouldn't work. And I've thought of that so many times, wondering why more people don't keep on keeping on until they run out of things that won't work, for then they're bound to find the thing that will work. And last but not least, the most important of all, the habit of personal initiative must begin by its application in the small, unimportant circumstances of one's daily life. The small, unimportant circumstances of life may lead to greatness for those with personal initiative. Witness this story about how one simple act by a young man was his first step to fame and fortune. It happened one frosty morning when the private railroad car of Charles M. Schwab was shifted to a sidetrack at the steel mill in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. As Mr. Schwab climbed down from the car, he was met by a young man with a stenographer's notebook in his hands, who explained that he was a stenographer in the company's office, and he had come down to meet Mr. Schwab with the hope that he might write any letters or telegrams that the steelmaster would care to send. Who requested you to meet me here, Mr. Schwab inquired. It was my own idea, sir, the young man replied. I knew you were coming on the early morning train because I handled the telegrams announcing your arrival. Mr. Schwab thanked the young man for his thoughtfulness and said he would call on him later in the day if he needed his services. And he did. When Schwab's private car returned to New York City that night, young Al Williams was aboard. He was transferred at Mr. Schwab's request to the Steelmaster's private office in New York. In his new job, young Williams had an opportunity to meet and to become acquainted with many of Mr. Schwab's influential Wall Street bankers and brokers. And through his acquaintanceship, some five years later, he was invited to become president of a large wholesale drug company at a fabulous salary and a stock interest in the company. To reach any goal, self-discipline is essential. Self-discipline causes you to think first and act afterwards. It begins with mastery of your thoughts, and accordingly, your deeds. Self-discipline will give you complete control over your emotions and your physical habits. We begin with the essential items called the Big Four. The Big Four musts, which must be under control at all times, is number one, the appetite for food and drink, number two, the mental attitude, and number three, the budgeting of time, and number four, definiteness of purpose. Auto-suggestion, which is a suggestion which you make to yourself, 
through uh, dominating thoughts and deeds is the medium by which self-discipline becomes a habit. And the starting point in the development of self-discipline is definiteness of purpose. Obsessional desire is the dynamo that gives life and action to definiteness of purpose. And be careful what you set your heart upon through obsessional desire, because the subconscious mind goes to work translating that desire into its material equivalent. Self-discipline cannot be attained overnight. It must be developed step by step by the formation of definite habits of thought and action. I'm going to give you ten rules for profitable self-discipline. These are rules of my own making. They're very homely, some of them, but they'll be very helpful. And number one is keep cool when other people get hot. I know you can agree with that one, but I'm not so sure that you'll always live up to it. We are inclined, all of us, to get hot when the other fellow gets hot. Say angry things when the other fellow starts saying angry things. I was in the home of the president of a big electric power company one evening when there came a storm and he called up one of his head men to go out to take care of an emergency that happened as a result of that storm. It was on Sunday evening. The man was gone about two hours and when he came back, he came up on the front porch of the home of this man and called him out on the porch and I never heard a man get such a tongue lashing in all my life as this president of the electric power company gets. As you blankety blank blank, you think because you're the president of the company, blankety blank blank, and I'm just as good as you are, blankety blank blank. Oh, it was terrific. I only heard one side of the conversation because there was only one side of it. One man was doing all the talking, and one man was doing all the listening. And after this had been going on for fully three minutes, the other man ran out of wind and had nothing more to say. He was mad, you see, because they'd called him out on this stormy night. I heard the president close the door and he came back and he just smiled and said, why, the man was a little bit hot, wasn't he? <laughs> That's all he said. A little bit hot, wasn't he? I expected any moment to hear a fist begin to fly out there. But you see, there was a man who had risen to great uh, heights of achievement financially and he had done it uh, by self-discipline. Self-discipline in every respect. And he didn't propose to allow a workman who had been temporarily unbalanced by his anger to throw him off balance and make him stoop to that level. He just didn't propose to have that done. And you'll notice when you get into an argument with anyone, and you're apt to if you don't watch yourself, that if you'll just remain silent while the other fellow is blowing off his top, he finally gets to the point where he's got no more top to blow off. Then if you want to get in a few words of your own, that's a mighty good place to do it. It's a mighty fine thing if the words that you get in are not the kind of the words you've been hearing. In other words, if you say something back kind in return, it's far better for the other fellow and far better for you. It shows you to be the bigger of the two persons. Now, anybody can get mad and blow his top because of what somebody does or says, and that's happening all the time. But the truly big man, the man who is in charge of himself, he doesn't allow anybody to draw him down to that level of a street brawl or of an argument in harsh words unless he wants to do it. And if he's truly a big man, he doesn't want to do it. Number two, remember there are three sides to all arguments. We ordinarily think there are two sides to all arguments, but they're not, the three. There's your side, there's the other fellow's side, and then there's the right side, which is usually about in the middle of the two viewpoints. Remember that when you get into an argument with the other fellow. Don't assume that he's always at fault. Maybe you're partly at fault, too. Maybe neither one is totally at fault. The chances are, in all of the arguments I've ever heard, both parties were partly to blame in one way or another. I have never yet heard an argument where one party entirely was to blame, although I suspect there are such arguments at times. Number three, never give directives to a subordinate when you're angry. If the matter is urgent, then cool off quickly. Number four, treat all people as nearly as possible as if they were rich relatives from whom you expected to be remembered in their will. <laughs> Now, that's a good one. That's a honey. <laughs> that is a honey. If you just do that, treat all people as if they were uh, rich relatives from whom you expected to inherit something at their death. And you can do that. You know, if you had a rich relative that had a million dollars he was going to leave to you, or you suspected he was going to, it wouldn't make very much difference what he said or did. He would never throw you off balance. You'd never talk back to him, would you? Of course you wouldn't. You'd be quite silly if you did. <laughs> Keeping quiet for a million dollars seems to me <laughs> to be a very easy price to pay. Number five, 
look for the seed of an equivalent benefit in every unpleasant circumstance with which you meet, no matter what the unpleasant circumstance is. Make it a point to discipline yourself so that you look for that seed of an equivalent benefit and you start looking in connection with the circumstance. Start right in where you stand. It'll lessen the blow. It'll lessen the hurt of the wound, whatever it happens to be, if you start looking for that seed of an equivalent benefit. And number six, learn the almost forgotten art of asking questions and then listening to the answers instead of getting the other fellow told off. It gives you an awful lot of satisfaction when you're angry to get the other fellow told, doesn't it? And the temptation is very great to do that. I know, because I've been there many times. Don't do it. Be bigger than that. Listen to what the other fellow has to say. And then when somebody makes a statement that you're not sure about, Learn to ask this one question. It's one of the most important questions in life. It'll serve more purposes than any other short question that I can think of. When somebody makes a statement that you're not sure about or that you doubt or that you question, ask a four-word question. How do you know? And then wait for an answer and see him squirm. Oftentimes there is no answer. People make wild statements that they can't back up. And instead of getting into an argument and making an incident out of the matter and getting yourself worked up into an argument, let the other fellow stew in his own fat by putting him over the barrel by that question, how do you know? I had a clergyman in my class once who was very, well, I just don't know exactly how to describe him. He was a, a, a fanatic, you might say, on the subject of religion. And he was sure that he knew exactly what was going to happen to me after death. He said so in no uncertain terms not in the class, but in a private conversation. And he raved and ranted for quite a little while about it. And when he got through, I said, how do you know, Parson? And that really put him over the barrel. He said, that's the way I feel about it. That's my faith. I said, well, now, have, uh, belief and faith is one thing, but having evidence is something else again. How do you know what's going to happen to me after I die? I don't know, and I doubt that you do. How do you know? Well, he never did give me a satisfactory answer. There are a lot of questions that come up in life in connection with which if you'll ask that one thing, how do you know you'll find that the other fellow will be off balance and you don't need to make an incident out of what he says, you don't need to get mad at what he says. Seven, never say or do anything which may influence another person without first asking yourself this question. Will it benefit him or hurt him? And if it will hurt him, don't do it. Don't say anything or do anything that would hurt another person under any circumstances, no matter how much he may deserve it. Exercise self-discipline. Don't do that because if you hurt another man, you're going to hurt yourself ten times as much at least because that hurt will come back on you. I don't care who you are nor what circumstances you're working under or living under. If you hurt another person, you will be hurt ten times as much. And if the hurt doesn't come immediately, the uh, rate of interest on that is compound interest on compound interest and it'll be a hundred times as great if you wait long enough. Because everything that you do to or for another person, you do to or for yourself. There is no escape from that. That's just as much a law as the law of gravitation, which everyone understands. You know that if you stepped over the top of this building, no matter what your mind uh, was or what your belief happened to be, if you stepped over the top of this building and violated the law of gravitation, that you'd hit the ground and you'd die in a very few seconds. And this law, which brings you back that which you send out, is just as inevitable, just as inexorable as the law of gravitation or any other of nature's laws. Number eight, learn the difference between friendly analysis and unfriendly criticism. Then decide which you wish to live by in your relations with others. Now, friendly analysis is one thing and is welcomed by most sensible people. I don't object to friendly analysis of anything that I do, even though it's very unfavorable. If it's friendly analysis, I like it because I can improve by it. But if it's unfriendly criticism, very obviously unfriendly criticism and not analysis, well, then I resent it. I wouldn't be human if I didn't. How can I tell whether it's friendly analysis or unfriendly criticism? <clears throat> How would you go about telling? There are a lot of ways you can tell. You can tell by the, uh, your relationship to the person who's making it, whether it's friendly or unfriendly to begin with. If it's an enemy, obviously I discount it right off the bat because you almost know it's going to be unfriendly criticism. I can tell also by the tone of voice in which he does it, by the manner in which he does it. Because a man who engages in unfriendly criticism generally uh, uses a few epithets along with it that clearly indicates that he's biased. If you have self-discipline, you're not going to be influenced by that kind of a person. And number nine, remember that a good leader in any calling is one who can take orders as cheerfully as he gives them. 
And number 10, last but not least, remember that tolerance in human relations is just as important as tolerance in the operation of mechanics. I want to give you some examples of what lack of self-discipline can do. I come from down in Virginia, and our adjoining sister state is West Virginia, where my sons now live. And we know the Hatfields and the McCoys on both sides. I've known them back down through the years. Several generations ago, one of the Hatfields of boar pigs got over in one of the McCoy's cornfields, and the McCoy sat his dog on the pig and tore his ear off. The pig wasn't worth over a dollar and a half at that time at the most. But they started shooting one another at sight over that pig, and I don't know how many Hatfields and how many McCoys have been killed, but it's been quite a number. They kept that up for two generations. Killing one another at sight over a boar pig worth a dollar and a half. Uh, you know, somewhere along there, somebody failed to use self-discipline. A lot of it. The idea of killing a man over a hog, or killing a man for any reason, for that matter. We started that feud and became famous all over the country, and I haven't the slightest doubt what every one of you has heard of the Hatfields and the McCoys. No imaginary feud, it was a real one. Now, the habit of making an incident out of petty annoyances is one of the things that most of us indulge in, very gratefully to our detriment, almost every day of our lives. Making an incident out of petty annoyances, allowing it to become an incident instead of just winking at it or looking in the other direction or keeping silent. The man who exercises self-discipline doesn't allow anybody else to make an incident that he doesn't want to occur. Life is filled with unpleasant things that one must deal with. Never fan the fire of an unpleasant incident into the white heat of an argument. You can always avoid it if you try. You know, a very small incident can start a feud just like the Hatfield McCoy feud that lasts down through the years and destroys your appetite, it gives you stomach ulcers, gives you headaches, causes your teeth to decay sooner than they would otherwise, and the Lord only knows what other things it does to you, allowing a little insignificant incident to just upset you, disturb you, and throw you off balance. Don't do it. You don't have to do it. Be more dignified than that. Be more becoming. Be more appreciative of that great prerogative that the Creator gave you, that is, the ability to control your own mind and to make it whatever you want it to be. There's a good definition of the mastermind. It's an alliance of two or more people working in harmony with a positive mental attitude for the attainment of a definite end. Two or more people working in harmony, perfect harmony, with a positive mental attitude for the attainment of a definite end. Now, that definition sounds simple enough, yet there is very much more back of it than meets the ear and the eye. When I first was introduced to Andrew Carnegie, the first question I asked him was to tell me in as few words as he possibly could to what he owed his fortune. And he then said, well, my fortune is due entirely to the work of my mastermind group. And he said that mastermind is not made up of any one mind, it's made up of more than 20 men whose background, experience, education, temperament, and ability have been combined and blended and directed to a definite end in a spirit of perfect harmony. And that end is the making and the marketing of steel. That was the first time in my life I ever heard of the mastermind. And later on, as I commenced to contact these other men of great achievement, I found out there was no such a possibility as great achievement except by the application of the master mind. That is to say, unless you learn to connect your mind with the minds of other people, use their education, their ability, their foresight, their temperament, and sometimes their capital, you'll never get very far. All of these great achievements, like General Motors and General Electric, Commonwealth Edison, are the results of mastermind alliances, including the application and use of other people's money. The mastermind principle is the medium through which one may procure the full benefits of the experience, the training, the education, and specialized knowledge of others of influence, just as completely as if their minds were in reality one's own. For example, contemplate what happened in the life of Thomas A. Edison who was thrown out of school after he had been there three months and sent home with a note to his parents saying that he had an adult mind and couldn't take an education. He never went back to school again. He never knew anything about any of the sciences, yet he selected as his major purpose in life a calling that made it necessary for him to use all of the sciences, practically. He had to have a technical ability, he had to have scientific training, he had to have a great variety of things, and yet he had none of those. And what did he do about it? 
He did what every successful man does who undertakes something that's beyond the realm of his own achievements. He surrounded himself with men who did have that ability, men who did understand chemistry, men who did understand physics, men who had the necessary training that he himself didn't possess, and he told them what to do, and they showed him how to do it. And in every instance where you find a man of outstanding achievement in any calling, you will find that he has been a success as a result of a mastermind alliance of one sort or another. Up here in Minnesota, they have the great Mayo Brothers Clinic, probably the greatest medical clinic of its nature in the entire world. And the reason it's great, to, there are many reasons for it, but one of the reasons is that they have in that institution medical men with almost every conceivable type of specialty of training. So that when they put a man through there and he's looked over by all of those men, why they know what's inside of him and what's outside of him. There's no small number of doctors that could ever render the service, such as the Mayo brothers render, because they understand and use the mastermind principle. Through the experience and knowledge of the geologist, one may understand the structure of this earth without training in geology. And through the experience and knowledge of a chemist, one may make practical use of chemistry without being a trained chemist. And incidentally, a man may uh, choose as his major objective in life any purpose that he desires, and even though that purpose involves the education which he does not possess, he can easily bridge that deficiency by surrounding himself with people who do have that education. Through the knowledge and skill of scientists, technicians, physicists, and practical engineers, one may become a successful inventor. Now, the second premise of the mastermind is this. An active alliance of two or more minds in a spirit of perfect harmony for the attainment of a common objective stimulates each individual's mind to a higher degree of courage than that which is ordinarily experienced and prepares the way for that state of mind known as faith. If you've ever had the experience of sitting down in what you might call a bull session or a round table session and starting in to talk about any problem or any subject, you will find that as the discussion goes on, you learn more and more about that subject and oftentimes, the man that will come forth with the most enlightening conversation on the subject will be the one that knows the least about it, because the harmony of minds enables each individual mind to tune in on sources of information not available to you under any other circumstance. That mastermind alliance stimulates the mind and jumps it up, steps it up, where you can tune in on the ether, which perhaps connects your thinking brain with infinite intelligence. That's a theory that might even be a fact. The third premise, a mastermind alliance properly conducted stimulates each mind in the alliance to move with enthusiasm, with personal initiative, with imagination and courage to a degree far above that which the individual experiences when moving without such an alliance. If you have the right kind of mastermind allies uh, when uh, going is hard, when you have problems that you don't know how to solve, you just go around and get your mastermind allies together and start talking about that problem. Start talking with the feeling that somewhere along in the conversation, somebody will come up with the answer. And you'll be surprised oftentimes at the person who does come up with it, maybe the one you least expect. And the third premise, a mastermind alliance properly conducted stimulates each mind in the alliance to move with enthusiasm, personal initiative, imagination, and courage to agree far above that which the individual experiences when moving without such an alliance. I duplicate that because I want you to keep it in mind. And the fourth premise, to be effective, a mastermind alliance must be active. It's not just enough to form a group and say, well, we're going to get together, and that's my mastermind group. It must be active. The mere association of minds is not enough. They must engage in pursuit of a definite purpose and they must move with perfect harmony. And they must do it continuously. And without the factor of harmony, the alliance may be nothing more than ordinary cooperation or friendly coordination of effort, which is something vastly different from the mastermind. The mastermind gives one full access to the spiritual powers of the other members of that alliance. The spiritual powers now, mind you. A great number of years ago, I had the privilege of dining at the Chicago Athletic Club with the Big Six of Chicago. Now, the Big Six were William Wrigley, Jr., A.D. Lasker, the owner of the Lord and Thomas Advertising Agency, Mr. Rich and Mr. Hertz, who founded the Yellow Taxi Cab Company, 
Mr. McCulloch, who owned the Parmley Transfer and Express business in Chicago, the largest of its kind in the world, and John R. Thompson, who owned the chain of stores. All of those men started, not too many years before I'd met them, without any capital, started on the basis of meeting every Saturday night, going into a discussion of each man's definite major purpose, and each one had a definite object he wanted to attain, and nobody had any money. And when I uh, met them, the uh, combined wealth of those six men was around 25 millions of dollars. They had all become successful. They had become successful by lending one another their mental attitude wrapped up in this principle of, of a mastermind. It's an astounding thing what can happen when two or more people get together and continuously uh, meet and discuss the things that the two of them want to do. And incidentally, you as an individual may have one objective and the man who is in the mastermind alliance with you may have another. You don't have to have the same objective at all. But if you work together in a spirit of friendly harmony, you will find that you will get results. The fifth premise, it's a matter of established record that all individual successes based upon any kind of achievement above mediocrity are attained through the mastermind principle and not by individual effort alone. Most successes are the result of personal power and personal power of sufficient proportions to enable one to rise above mediocrity is not possible without the application of the mastermind principle. I had the privilege during uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt's first administration of helping to build for the president and his administration perhaps the most astounding and outstanding mastermind alliance this or any other nation has ever known. And the object of that mastermind alliance was to stop the stampede of fear. Remember after Roosevelt went into office, Shortly after that, they had to close down all of the banks because they were having runs on banks, and people were in such a state of fear we had to do something drastic about it. We had to organize all of the public opinion molding machinery of the country and place it back in the president without bias, without prejudice, without regard to political affiliation. And here are the six factors that went into that mastermind alliance. First of all, both houses of Congress working in harmony with the president. For the first time in the history of this nation, we had both houses of Congress working tooth and toenail in harmony with FDR. They forgot about political branches. They forgot about political expediency. They uh, became as one behind the president of the United States. And the president of the United States at that time and in that emergency had no brand as a Democrat or a Republican. Second, the majority of the newspaper publishers of America we induced them to take the uh, scare headlines of business depression out of the paper and to supplant them with the uh, better lines of business recovery. Start talking about business recovery instead of business depression. And then we wrote appropriate news items for the newspapers and sent them out all over the country. And as far as I know, no paper ever refused to print exactly what we sent out. And third, the radio station operators of the country, they were sent material to use and they used it just as it was sent. They got on the idea of business recovery. They got back at the president. And number four, the churches of all denominations. That was one of the most beautiful things, ladies and gentlemen, I have ever hoped to see in all of my life. It was Catholics and Protestants, Jews and Gentiles, all getting behind the president of the United States and forgetting for the time being whether they were Catholics or Protestants, whether they were Jews or Gentiles. It is one of the most magnificent things I ever hope to witness. Number five, uh, leaders of both major political parties. I'm not talking about the rank and file, I'm talking about the leaders. Did you know that out of several hundred congressmen and senators, the real leaders who manage your affairs and mine and who are responsible for them consist of less than 50 people? Less than 50. The rest are just like sheep. The real leaders are the ones that set the policy and carry out the policy. We got these leaders of both political parties for the first time in the history of this nation to get back of FDR. They didn't just stop to question whether he was a Democrat or whether he was a Republican, whether he was going to help their party or not. They got back of him 100%. They stayed back of him long enough to get this depression stopped, to get this uh, stampede stopped. And then the most magnificent thing of all, perhaps, number six, a majority of the American people of all political and religious leanings the rank and file. And how did we get to those American people? Well, we got to them through those five public opinion molding sources that I've just mentioned, especially the radio and the newspapers and the pulpits. Now, had it not been for the organization of the machinery through which public opinion in this country was organized and put back of Roosevelt under the mastermind principle, I'm telling you, 
that the results he got in his first administration never would have been obtained in that administration if in any one of them. Here was an alliance of many millions of people which in the aggregate produced power such as this nation had never observed previously and it was sufficient to stop a national stampede of fear and averted what might otherwise have become a national catastrophe or a rebellion of the people. Andrew Carnegie and his industrial staff consisting of more than 20 business associates formed the most outstanding and the most effective business mastermind that I have ever known. I found that same principle obtaining it all the way down to all of the experiences that I had with men. Namely, that the men who were succeeding in the greatest way used the brains and the personality and the influence of other people. The word contact, ladies and gentlemen, is a great word. Do you know that if you have the right contacts, you can do anything you want? Contacts. Having somebody at the right time to come to the front and do something for you is a perfectly marvelous thing. And no matter who you are and what business you're in, it's up to you, it's your responsibility to commence forming contacts, friendly contacts, especially on the bank. You never know when you need something down the bank. Have a contact down there. Somebody knows you. Surprising what you can do through contacts. Incidentally, one of the places, perhaps the greatest place, where the Mastermind Alliance can be used to greatest advantage is in the home between the man and his wife. I suspect I have been uh, responsible for influencing the building of more masterminds in the home than probably any other living person. And every time I hear of having accomplished a feat like that, I feel proud of it. I have reestablished and revitalized domestic relationships in thousands of homes. I was impressed when I first met Mrs. Henry Ford with her story about the beginning of his career. Back in the days when she was standing back in the kitchen with an eyedropper dropping gasoline into a little gadget he'd made drop at a time while he was manipulating an electric battery trying to get it to spark. This gadget was a piece of six inch pipe on one end of which had been sealed and in the other end there had been projected a piston. And he was for powering this gasoline in through what since has become known as the carburetor. And he was trying to ignite it from within. And after weeks of effort he got the ignition to kick that piston out just one time. And there was born an industry that has spelted this earth, a fortune that will go on going on, a fortune that has employed millions of people, changed the American way of life. Going back to the time when Henry Ford and Mrs. Ford were working in that humble way, and she told me of a time when, while he was building that first automobile, he needed $30 worth of parts, foundry parts. He went down to the foundry and ordered them. And when he went down to get them, he told the foundry man he didn't have the money, but he would come down at the end of the month and pay for them. And the foundry man said, oh, no, you don't. I wouldn't trust you with a nickel, not on that darn contraption you're wasting your time on, not on your life. Money on the barrel head or no go. He went back and told Mrs. Ford, and she said, well, Henry, you know, we have $1,200 in the bank that we've been saving with the understanding we'd only use it to build a house. He said, yes, that's it. We're not going to use it for anything else either. She said, well, don't use it for anything else, but borrow $30 from it and go down and pay the man. She said, well, after all, we are good for $30, aren't we? And he said, well, if you put it that way, I guess we are. So he went back down and drew off $30, borrowed it from themselves and got his parts. That shows you how lacking Henry Ford was in the beginning with the necessary courage to do the things he wanted to do. It was the influence of Mrs. Ford. It was the uh, influence of the female side of that mastermind alliance that made the great Ford industry what it was. And it's perfectly astounding. It's miraculous. What can happen when a man's wife is back of him like Mrs. Ford was back of her husband? I happen to know the intimate life of Thomas A. Edison and Mrs. Edison, and the same thing was true there. Mr. Edison said that the vast majority of his inventions were due to the continuous mastermind alliance of his wife. And you know, he used to work until very late at night, and when he'd come home, no matter what hour, she was always up waiting for him and had some hot milk and toast ready for him. That was about all he could take at night. And then they sat down, and before they went to bed, he went over his experiments with her, told her what his problems had been. In other words, they reviewed his whole day's work. And she uh, did it in such a way that she gave him the encourage to keep on keeping on when the going was exceedingly hard. Now, there are two general types of mastermind alliances. Number one, alliances for purely social or personal reasons, consisting of one's relatives, friends, and religious advisors, where no material gain is sought. The most important of this type, of course, is the mastermind alliance between a man and his wife. And number two, an alliance for business or professional advancement, 
consisting of individuals who have a personal motive or a material or financial nature connected with the object of the alliance. There must be a motive. There, you can have no mastermind alliance without every individual member of it having a motive. You must be getting something out of it. You can't form a mastermind alliance and use the brains and the experience and the friendship and the love and the affection and maybe the capital of the other fellow without him getting something back from it. Even though he's willing to give it for a time, don't you accept it. Don't accept anything from anybody unless you're giving something of an equivalent value in return in one way or another. Bear that in mind. Just don't do it. Because if you do, the relationship will play out sooner or later. And I made it a point never, never to receive favors from anybody uh, without returning those favors. It's a good habit for anybody to follow. One alliance you cannot do without comes from within. We'll continue our look at the mastermind concept and forging a connection with all the facets of your inner self. You'll hear how Napoleon Hill developed his own inner support group and how you can do the same thing. Well, before I tell you what my system is, I want to tell you about one of the most interesting mastermind allies that I had. His name was Dr. Elmer R. Gates of Chevy Chase, Maryland. Andrew Carnegie knew about Dr. Gates and about his marvelous system of drawing upon the invisible powers of the universe, and he sent me to see Dr. Gates with a letter of introduction. When I got there, I presented my letter, and his secretary said, well, I'm sorry, but Dr. Gates is not available for the next three hours. He's now sitting for ideas. I said, I beg your pardon. He is now sitting for ideas. I said, where is he sitting? I looked around. Well, she said only Dr. Gates would be able to answer that one. He has a secret room into which he disappears when he wants to sit for ideas. You can come back within three hours or you can wait if you like. I said, I'm going to wait. I don't want to get out of this place until I see Dr. Gates. In about two hours and a half, he came out and I told him about my conversation with his secretary. He said, by the would you like to see where I sit for ideas? I said, I certainly would. And he took me back into a room about 12 by 12 walls had been insulated to cut out all sound. There was nothing in that room but a table against the wall and over the table an electric switch. And on the table a bunch of scratch pads and some pencils. And he explained to me that when he, uh, and by the way he was a great inventor, a great scientist, when he wanted to solve a problem and there was an unknown quantity X that he hadn't found, he goes into his concentration room, shuts off the lights, shuts off the sound, and concentrates his mind upon that which he wants. And sometimes he gets the answer within a matter of minutes, sometimes in a matter of hours, and once in a while not at all. Sitting for ideas, letting his subconscious mind contact him with the source of knowledge necessary to give him the answer to his problem. And by that method, he created over 250 inventions which have been registered in the patent office of the United States. I became intrigued by Dr. Gates's experiment because if he had not been a man of great achievement, I would have written him off as a long-haired nut, as we sometimes call him. But there was a man of great achievement, and I can always learn from the man who has done more than I have in life. I started to study this subject of ESP, and I came up with a system of my own, which I would now like to describe for you. First of all, I created these invisible entities. I call them my invisible guides. Each one assigned to do for me automatically, night and day, a job that I need to have done in order to carry out my objective in life. And the number one of these invisible guides is the guide to sound physical health. Now his job is to keep my body eternally in good shape. The moment I lay the carcass down at night and go to sleep, he goes to work on me. And when I get up in the morning, I feel like a million dollars, or maybe two or three million, depending on what I'm thinking about. I shouldn't go into any detail as to whether or not he's doing a good job. You can take a look at me and come in contact with him and make your own decision. When I tell you that I've only been sick once in my life, really sick, you know that I have had an unusual system to keep a well. If all the doctors had to depend upon men like myself, believe you me, they'd have to change their profession. They surely would. Well, number two is the guide to financial prosperity. And he has put me in a position where I don't need anything at all of a material nature that I can't buy. 
I don't have any debts. I don't have any mortgages on our home. I don't have any mortgages on our car. I don't buy cars or anything else on installment plan. We have funds. Well, in so many different institutions, I wouldn't be able to name all of them. We're not as rich as Carnegie, but uh, we're as rich as we need to be. We have enough absolute security in old age, which gives you a wonderful feeling to know that uh, as old age comes along, you don't have to go to the poor house or depend upon relatives. So the uh, guide to financial prosperity is doing all right. And number three is the guide to peace of mind. Now his job is to keep my mind eternally free from all of the causes and the effects of fear and worry. You know, fear and worry kills off more talented people and untalented people than all the other subjects combined in all probability. Fear and worry. I don't have any fears. I used to have a flock of them before I adopted the system, but I don't have them anymore. They're all gone. And the next two are twins. They are the guides to hope and faith. They uh, give me hope for what's going to happen to me in the future in connection with my aims and purposes and backing up that hope, the faith in my ability to do it. And I want to tell you that they're doing a good job. My hopes are not just a matter of reaching up in thin air and pulling down something that I'd like to do, but I have not only backed up those hopes with faith, but you who come in contact closely with us here can see that we have a very close-knit, well-organized plan, and we're carrying out that plan, and you're becoming a part of it. You're becoming a very powerful and important part of that plan. And the next two are also twins. They are the guides to love and romance. And when I speak of love, I speak of that great emotion in its widest and broadest and most divine application. Love and romance. I can find romance out of everything that crosses my path, whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. If it's unpleasant, I romance the idea that I'll find that seed of the equivalent benefit and I'll make use of it. Love. What a marvelous thing it is to have a feeling of love in your heart. I have been accused of carrying this emotion to extremes on some occasions, but I don't think so. Mrs. Hill and I were driving out in the mountains of California about 10 years ago, and we saw on the side of the road an enormous rattlesnake coiled and ready to strike. Annie Lou saw it about the same time I did. She said, hit it, right, hit it. Well, I didn't hit it. I wheeled around and entirely bypassed it. She said, why didn't you hit it? I said, my dear, the reason I didn't hit it, it's on its own ground, attending its own business, and that's exactly what you and I are going to do. We're not going to kill something that doesn't concern us. And that's the attitude that I would take toward a rattlesnake or anything else. If it didn't try to bother me or some of my friends, I wouldn't bother it. In other words, I've changed my whole attitude, not only toward my fellow men, but toward every living creature on the face of this earth. The next one is a lately acquired member of my imaginary family. He's the guide to patience. I acquired that during the past 10 years with experiences that required a lot of patience. Thank heavens, that's one of the things I can count on that I got out of those 10 years that have been beneficial, patience. Patience enables you to time things properly, not just to plant the seed today and then go back tomorrow and dig it up to see whether it's going to germinate or not. If you plant your seed with faith in the right kind of soil at the right time of the year and know that the seed is sound, you can forget about it because nature takes over at that point. And for every seed of wheat that you put in the ground under the proper circumstances, nature will bring you back five or six hundred grains to compensate you for your intelligence. And it works on other planes just the same as in the soil. Number nine is the guide to overall wisdom. And his job is to keep me benefited by every experience that touches my life, whether it's good or bad, positive or negative. Everything that touches my life is grist for my mill. I make some use out of it. If it's an unpleasant experience, I try to surround myself with enough protection to see that the same thing won't happen again. And believe you me, we all need that kind of a protection. Not to let things that happen to you that are unpleasant happen over and over and over again. I like to remember that very interesting Chinese proverb which says, If a man injure me once, shame on him. But if that man injure me twice, shame on me. <laughs> and the last one is an interesting one. His name is Norm Hill and that's a combination of my wife's maiden name and mine. And he's my roving ambassador. 
His job is to do the things that have not been specifically assigned to the other nine. Such, for example, I'm in my car and I'm driving downtown and in these traffic conditions nowadays in almost every city it's difficult to get a parking spot. But I never have any trouble in getting a parking spot because I send Norm Hill ahead and he has a place cleared out for me by the time I get there. About a couple of years ago, I was telling one of my neighbors about this Norm Hill fellow, and he said, well, isn't that interesting? I said, now, by the way, if I want to go down to the bank on Friday afternoon, banks close at one o'clock Friday, and I didn't have but a few minutes to get down there, not time enough to go over to a parking lot, which is four or five blocks away from the bank where I do business, I would send Norm Hill ahead, and when I got there, he'd have me a place right in front of the bank. Well, he said, that reminds me, I have got to go to the bank. Would you mind letting me see how Norm Hill works? I said, hop in, we don't have much time. And I drove pretty fast. And when we got down in front of the South Carolina National Bank, sure enough, there was no parking spot. Every place on both sides of the street was filled. And I stopped my car about three car lengths back of the front of the bank, and this man said, uh -huh. I said, well, Norm Hill must have walked, and I noticed you drove pretty fast. I said, don't you worry about Norm Hill. He'll be here in good time. And within the time that I've been telling you the story, the man came out of the bank and got in the car right in front of the bank and drove off. And one after him got in the, the next one, and there were two spots. And I said, you see there? One to compensate me for my intelligence, and one to show you that you ought to think twice before you criticize Norm Hill. <laughs> I delivered a speech before Mr. W. Clement Stone's manager down in Miami, Florida, about six years ago, in which I described for them, as I have described for you, my ten invisible gods. And when we got down to Norm Hill, you should have heard these men laugh. <laughs> they thought it was terribly funny. But the first thing I knew, I would say within six months, Every one of those men was using the same plan, and not only were they using it in connection with getting such minor things as parking spot, but they were sending their salesmen out. Their salesmen work under what is called uh, cold turkey. That is to say, everybody they meet is a prospect. They don't have to have an appointment. Those salesmen were using that same plan, and they were sending Norn Hill ahead to talk to the man they were going to interview and selling him before the salesman ever got on the job. That is an astounding thing. Well, when these men first started that plan, Mr. Stone's men were earning, I should say, an average of $175, $200 a week, and within a year after that, they were averaging around $250 to $500 a week, and entirely because Norm Hill had changed their mental attitude so that when they went in to sell a man, they didn't hear him when he said no. He kept on talking. Isn't that an astounding thing? You know, most of us here know before the man says it. We know he's going to say no, and he picks up our mental attitude and reflects it back to us as, as his own. I used to work in a bank when I was a youngster as a teller. And I could tell when a man came into the front door and started toward my cage whether he expected to get what he was coming after or not. I certainly could. I could tell it every time. By the way he walked, by the way he looked around furtively, and by his attempt to engage me in useless conversation after he got up to the teller's cage before he presented the check. All intended to throw me off balance. An astounding thing what you can do in dealing with people if you understand these principles that I'm now talking about. We've just about conquered everything in the universe. We're now trying to conquer outer space. We've about uh, done everything we can to uncover the powers of nature. But there's one yet unresolved objective we have not attained. We haven't learned how to live with one another. And one of the greatest things that this philosophy can do for you and those whom you contact and the world around you is to teach people how to live with one another under the mastermind principle so that they have more joy in living, they have more prosperity, they have better health, and they make this a better country into which to live. How can one control mental attitude? Well, there are a good many ways of controlling it. First, by exercising the power of will directed to definite purposes based upon definite motives. If you give yourself a sufficient motive for wanting to attain an objective or do a certain thing, you'll have no trouble in controlling your mental attitude in connection with that one thing. It depends entirely upon your motive, how badly you want to do it. If your motive is not strong, the chances are you'll weaken when opposition comes along. 
And the more of those motives that are activated by, the stronger will be your application of the power of faith. Second, by keeping the mind charged with a burning desire for the attainment of definite objectives of a positive nature. Keeping your mind charged at all times. The mind is a peculiar piece of machinery. You know, it's something like a garden spot. I can't think of a better simile than this. It's something like a rich garden spot. And you've all perhaps lived at one time or another when there was a garden spot attached to the house or nearby where in the finest weeds on the farm would grow. <laughs> Just didn't find weeds like them anywhere else. And also, you didn't have to cultivate the weeds. Wasn't that strange? You did have to cultivate the cabbages and the tomatoes and other things, but the weeds, you didn't have to cultivate them. You didn't even have to plant them. They planted themselves. <laughs> the mind is like that rich garden spot. If you don't plant in it the things you want to grow out of it and then keep the things that you don't want out, the things you don't want will take the place, just the same as they do in your garden spot. There's no two ways about it. It'll work that way. You've got to keep your mind so busy doing and thinking about the things you want that it has no time whatsoever to sprout these seeds of weeds that will grow there without your effort and without your want. In other words, keep your mind so busy getting the things you want that it has no time to think about the things you don't want. I think of all of the sins of human beings, the greatest sin is that of idleness, of allowing your mind to be idle, not doing anything at all, not working according to a plan. And next, by association with people who inspire active engagement in positive purposes and refusal to be influenced by negative people. In other words, choosing the right people and avoiding the influences of the wrong people. And next, a profound recognition of the importance of the one prerogative of the Creator, that is, that you possess complete control of the mind at all times, if you'll only exercise that. Now then, how important is mental attitude? Well, judging from what I've just been saying, you'd say it's very important when well, I tell you that it's the main control over the power of faith. But here are some specific indications of how important mental attitude. First of all, your mental attitude is the major factor which attracts people to you or repels them. Did you ever think about that? Did you ever think that the people that are attracted to you are attracted to you not necessarily on account of what you do, nor on account of what you say, nor on account of what you look like? They're attracted to you on account of what you think. And you don't have to express it orally. You only have to think it in their presence. Of course, you can't just think a good thought in one's presence one time and then bad thoughts the next time. I mean, the, the positive mental attitude that you express all of the time reaches to the people that you come into contact with, that you do business with. And it brings them back to do business with you over and over again, or it repels them, keeps them away, and you wonder, what happened to that man? He used to come down here and patronize him, he never comes in here anymore. I didn't disabuse him, I didn't say anything out of the way to him, I treated him nicely. But if you go back to the bottom of it all, you probably would find out that your mental attitude was not right. You were worried about something when you talked to him. You were out of step with somebody, maybe out of step with yourself. You reflect yourself in your relationship with people. And next... Mental attitude is a major factor in the maintenance of sound health. Had you ever thought about that? It really is. You allow yourself to be worried day in and day out and see how quick you'll come down with a cold or a flu or something worse. Your body resistance is destroyed by a negative mental attitude. A positive mental attitude supports and feeds that body resistance, the thing that nature has provided in you to keep you well and healthy at all times. I have never yet known a person who was sickly uh, in any nature whatsoever that you couldn't trace that back very largely to a negative mental attitude. A positive mental attitude is the finest of all therapeutic agencies. All the doctors in the world cannot equal the importance of a positive mental attitude. And all of the better doctors of every school of therapeutics today recognize and make use of the necessity of helping the patient to maintain the right kind of a mental attitude toward the doctor and toward himself. Because you may be sure that the patient that does not have confidence in his doctor is not going to be benefited very much by that doctor, no matter who the doctor is and how much he knows. And next, your mental attitude is a determining factor as to whether you find peace of mind or go through life in a state of frustration and misery. Now, that's a determining factor, your mental attitude. You find peace of mind or you go through life in a state of frustration according to the extent to which you control and maintain the kind of mental attitude that you want. 
I don't know whether this impresses you the way it does me or not, but I think the most astounding thing in this whole universe consists in the fact that we know beyond any question of a doubt that the Creator gave man control over but one thing, not two things, but one thing, and that is his mental attitude. And surely the Creator intended that that was to be the most important thing in the world, and it is, because if you control your mental attitude, you control everything else within the sphere of life that you occupy. You're the dominating factor if you control your own mental attitude. Yet, the majority of people don't make any pretense of trying to control their mental attitude. They get mad at the drop of a hat. If the fellow doesn't drop the hat, they knock it off his head and then get mad. The next mental attitude is the very warp and the woof of all salesmanship, regardless of what you're selling. Yourself, services, merchandise, politics, religion, law, medicine, chiropractic, or whatever you're doing. You're selling something. We're all salesmen. Some of us, albeit, are not very good salesmen. We're very poor ones because we're selling in reverse gear instead of the third gear forward. It's the very warp and the whoop of all salesmanship. And unless you condition your mind to make a sale, you'll never make one. Somebody may buy something from you because he happens to need it and he can't get it anywhere else. But you may be sure you didn't have anything to do with making the sale unless you were in the right mental attitude when you were negotiating that sale. It's an important factor in connection with your entire station in life, the job you hold, the pay you receive, and the entire space that you occupy in the world is dependent largely upon the mental attitude that you maintain. And you never can occupy very much space in the world unless that positive attitude is positive at all times. The man with a negative mental attitude occupies some space. He occupies just as little space, however, as people can get him into. They don't go out of their way to make space for him. You know that. Nobody likes a grouch. Nobody likes a man who's got something on his chest he wants to get off. Nobody likes a man who is disgruntled or has a gripe or has a mean things to say about other people. Enthusiasm is the action factor of thought. Enthusiasm is often confused with animated feeling. But you can't get enthusiasm from jumping up and down or running around. Real enthusiasm comes from within influencing the subconscious mind to act promptly on your burning desires. And it generates enthusiasm on the part of others. When you turn on your enthusiasm, you step up the vibrations of thoughts which go out from your brain so that they reach and affect other people more quickly. As a matter of fact, you can send out thoughts which have been so stepped up with silent enthusiasm that they will reach and influence other people to whom you direct your thoughts. This is a fact which has been known to psychologists for ages, and it is also known to most master salesmen who use this method to condition the minds of their prospective buyers before they ever talk with them. You must have observed that the enthusiasm is very contagious that it engages the attention of those who come under its influence and causes them to respond in a similar spirit of enthusiasm. I once heard Andrew Carnegie say that if you turn loose one man who thought in terms of intense enthusiasm in an industrial plant employing thousands of people, this man's enthusiasm would very quickly reach and influence every person in the plant. And he said it made not the slightest difference whether the enthusiasm was negative or positive, constructive or destructive. Then Mr. Carnegie went on to explain that in his selection of employees for promotion to bigger jobs, the first thing he looked for was a man's capacity to express himself in terms of intense enthusiasm. He said that enthusiasm is one of the most important traits necessary for leadership. The most successful lawyers are not necessarily those who know most about the legal profession, but they are those who know how to influence courts and juries with their belief in their cases and have a great capacity for expressing themselves with enthusiasm. When you are introduced to another person, you have a marvelous opportunity to sell yourself favorably to that person by the extent of the enthusiasm you express in accepting the introduction. When you shake hands with another person, you have also a fine opportunity to make a favorable impression by the warmth of enthusiasm you put into that handshake. If there is anything which leaves me flat and unfavorably impressed when I'm introduced, it's an extended hand which feels like a piece of cold ham and acknowledges the introduction with a cold, canned, 
pleased to meet you, with no signs of enthusiasm back of it. Now, right here, let me give you a brief course in salesmanship, which may be of value to you the remainder of your life. When you meet anyone on whom you wish to make a favorable impression, when it is a stranger you have not previously met or someone with whom you are already acquainted, do these things. One, turn on your enthusiasm and so modulate your voice with it that you definitely make the other person feel you are happy to communicate with him. Two, when you shake his hand, take a firm grip on it and give it a quick, firm squeeze at the end of each word you express in your greetings. For example, say, how do you do? I am so very glad to meet you. Uh, do not crush the hand, however, as I have known some people to do. Three, then if you begin the conversation, be sure that you direct it to some subject of interest to the other person. And four, follow through by eagerly asking questions which will keep attention focused upon the other person. Then when you are ready to have the other person hear what you have to say about yourself or your interests or your business, he will have been prepared to listen attentively. For many years, I taught master salesmanship. And the first important thing I endeavored to teach my students was the importance of one, speaking with enthusiasm, and two, selling the prospective buyer himself before trying to sell him anything else. I've often told my students of salesmanship that the best possible way for one to sell himself to others is to first sell the others to themselves. That counsel was sound when I began training salesmen over 30 years ago, and it is still sound. When I was a youngster in school, I discovered that the teachers from whom I learned most were those who expressed the greatest enthusiasm in their teaching. And I have heard an experienced doctor say that the enthusiasm he carries into the sick room with him has more to do with helping to bring about a cure than all the medicine he can prescribe. And now let me give you another interesting sidelight on the effects of enthusiasm. I have noticed that enthusiasm not only influences others who come under its effect, but it also very distinctly influences and benefits those who follow the habit of expressing it in their thoughts and deeds. Enthusiasm is an expression of a positive mental attitude, and it has long been known to doctors that a positive mental attitude stands high on the list of influences which give one sound health. I suggest that a very practical way to begin learning to express yourself with enthusiasm will be to follow the habit of reading aloud for 10 minutes daily, putting all the enthusiasm at your command into your reading. You will be surprised in a short while at how much this will help you in speaking with enthusiasm in your ordinary conversations. I would suggest also that you adopt the habit of practicing enthusiasm in your conversations with your family and your business associates. Incidentally, this habit will make you more popular with those who are close to you. You can enjoy the benefits of enthusiasm if you are interested enough to develop a technique by which to acquire this habit so you will follow it in a natural, unaffected tone of voice. If you follow my suggestion that you read for 10 minutes daily as a means of acquiring the habit of enthusiasm, I recommend that you write down a list of 10 subjects, things, or circumstances in which you have the keenest interest and use this list for your practice purposes. Never let a day pass without devoting time to the habit of enthusiasm and the furthering of your plans. Practice speaking with enthusiasm before a mirror. If you meet with any sort of unpleasant circumstance, repeat your definite major purpose in life with great enthusiasm. Repeat it over and over until negative feeling is replaced by positive feeling. Controlled enthusiasm can have rich and certain rewards. Remember that autosuggestion is a powerful factor in the development of the habit of enthusiasm. So keep yourself sold on the belief that you'll obtain your definite major purpose no matter how far removed it may be. Your mental attitude will determine the action your subconscious mind will take in connection with the fulfillment of your purpose and keep your mind positive at all times. Enthusiasm thrives on positive thought and action. The subconscious mind can also be enlisted in the practice of creative vision or imagination. 
This creative vision may be inborn or it may be an acquired quality. It can be developed by the use of two types of imagination, as Dr. Hill explains. One, there is synthetic imagination consisting of a combination of recognized ideas, concepts, plans, or facts arranged in a new combination. Basically, new things or ideas are but rarely discovered. Nearly everything known to and used by modern civilization is only a combination of something that is old. And two, there is creative vision operating through the sixth sense and having its base in the subconscious section of the brain where it serves as the medium by which basically new facts or ideas are revealed. Now, one of the strange features of creative vision consists in the fact that it seldom operates unless it is quickened and inspired through a burning desire or some very definite and intense motive. First, as an example of the use of synthetic imagination, let us take the case of Thomas A. Edison's invention of the incandescent electric lamp. You may recall I told you on a previous program that Edison failed in more than 10,000 separate experiments before he finally uncovered the two simple ideas which, when combined, gave the world its first incandescent electric light. Now, you see, he was using synthetic imagination, putting together old ideas in a new way. Then, almost by mere chance, Edison resorted to the use of creative vision and got the answer to his problem in a matter of minutes. He had spent the entire day searching for the answer when he became exhausted and laid down for one of those 15-minute catnaps for which he was so famous. Just as he awoke, the elusive thing for which he had been searching through 10,000 failures flashed into his mind. It consisted of one of the two factors which went into the building of the incandescent electric lamp. He already had discovered one of these factors, namely that by applying electrical energy to both ends of a wire so as to form a short, the wire would heat up until it made a light. But the trouble was that the wire would also burn up almost instantly. The second factor was something known to man since the discovery of fire. It just took Thomas Edison's subconscious to help him connect it for an invention that was to change the world. It was the simple principle by which charcoal is produced. By setting a pile of wood on fire, covering it over with dirt, and allowing the heat to smolder until the wood is slowly burned into what is known as charcoal. You know that where there is no oxygen, there can be no combustion. Where there is but little oxygen, as in the case of that which percolates through the dirt, it slowly burns the wood into a charcoal. When this thought flashed into Mr. Edison's mind, he rushed back to his laboratory, placed a bent piece of wire into a bottle, pumped all the air out and sealed the bottleneck, then applied the electrical energy to the protruding ends of the wire, and lo, the world's first incandescent electric lamp was born, born of two simple ideas brought together in a new way. Naturally, the wire couldn't burn up quickly because no oxygen was reaching it, therefore no combustion. He hadn't used creative vision because he had not yet discovered it. But from there on out, Edison began to put the law of creative vision to work, and it helped him uncover more of nature's secrets than had been uncovered by all mankind up to that time. The invention of the incandescent electric lamp ushered in the great electrical age, which has been extended until it is an indispensable part of our entire system of economy. It has not only earned hundreds of billions of dollars in material riches and provided jobs to hundreds of thousands of people, but look what it has done to lighten the physical labor of all mankind. It is worthy of note that when the great overseer turns loose an idea in this world, it may become a part of the plan behind the entire universe. One of the features of creative vision is that it seldom operates unless it is inspired through a burning desire or a very definite and intense motive. When it's combined with synthetic imagination, the results can be spectacular. A good illustration is the case of Arvel and Wilbur Wright, who built and flew the first flying machine. Previously, no one had flown a heavier-than-air machine. But the Wright brothers kept on experimenting through the application of synthetic imagination until at long last the law of creative vision was revealed to them. Then they built the machine in which they made their first flight. 
Incidentally, you may be interested to know that the phonograph, or talking machine as it was originally called, was the only strictly basic invention that Thomas A. Edison ever created. All his other patents were revealed through a combination of synthetic imagination and creative vision. The idea for the talking machine flashed into Edison's mind out of thin air, as he described it. And he went to work right where he stood and made a rough drawing of the first model, produced the machine, tried it out, and it worked from the very first trial. There are several specific ways you can stimulate your own creative vision. Here, Dr. Hill gives you the key points in developing this principle for success. First, get on good terms with your own conscience by following its dictates always. Then, stop selling yourself short and begin developing a belief in your capacity to do anything you desire to do. And keep your mind so busily engaged in getting the things and creating the circumstances you want that it will have no time to worry about that which you do not want. Find out who you are, what you want from life what you have to give in return, and then back yourself with everything you have. Whet your imagination to a keen edge by keeping it everlastingly busy on something over which you can develop an obsessional desire. Obsessional, that is, not merely hopeful wishing. And be at least as good to your physical body as you are to your automobile by seeing that it gets the right sort of fuel and upkeep and the proper cleansing from the inside. Stop burdening yourself with fear and worry. Then set aside a silent hour when you will be still and listen for guidance through the small voice which speaks from within. Thus you may discover and appropriate the greatest of all powers, the power of creative vision. Creative vision is not the product of hustle and bustle and fear and worry and anxiety and greed. It is the product of meditation and silence and prayer. Controlled attention is the act of coordinating all the faculties of the mind and directing their combined power to a given end. Control is the key to this thought power. Attention that is not controlled and directed may be nothing more than idle curiosity. Success in all the higher brackets of individual achievement is attained by the application of thought power, properly organized and directed to definite ends. And power, whether it be thought power or physical power, is attained by concentration of energy. The greatest of all forms of thought power is that which is developed by the application of the master mind principle. For here, the power of many individual minds may be concentrated upon the attainment of any given object. The scientist concentrates his mind upon the search for the hidden facts and secrets of nature. And lo, the combined powers of the universe seem to conspire to reveal them to him. Military men concentrate upon organized warfare. And through their search for new and more effective weapons of warfare, they uncover new and better means of production in industry, new formula in chemistry, physics, biology, psychology, and many other shortcuts to desirable ends in the business of living. And concentration of military power at a given point is the means of major importance by which victories are gained. In business and in industry, the principle of concentration is the keynote of success. William Wrigley, Jr. concentrated upon the manufacture of a five-cent package of chewing gum and lived to see the entire nation of people take up the habit of chewing gum, not to mention the fortune he accumulated for his efforts. F.W. Woolworth concentrated upon the operation of five and ten-cent stores and accumulated a great fortune from the sale of gadgets and trinkets in the low-priced field of merchandise. John D. Rockefeller concentrated upon the refining and sale of oil and he made it yield him a fortune sufficient for the needs of 10,000 men. Henry Ford concentrated upon the manufacture and distribution of a low-priced, dependable automobile and became the directing head of one of America's greatest industrial enterprises. Edgar Bergen concentrated upon the, a block of wood called Charlie McCarthy and made it bring him fame and fortune far beyond his ordinary needs. Andrew Carnegie concentrated upon the manufacture and sale of steel and remained steadfast in his purpose until he ushered in the great steel age which was destined to change for the better the living habits and the standard of living of the people of an entire nation. His efforts yielded him more money than he could give away during his lifetime. 
Charles Darwin concentrated upon the principle of evolution, and his efforts brought enlightenment through the revelation of facts which stepped up education and general human progress a thousand years or more. Wilbur and Orville Wright concentrated upon the building of airplanes and lived to see the product of their brains become the master of the air. Thomas A. Edison concentrated upon scientific invention, and though he was practically without formal education, he lived to see the products of his brain serve mankind in no less than a hundred different ways, and to him the world is indebted for the great electrical age, which has improved the entire American way of life by lessening the labors of men. Henry J. Kaiser concentrated upon the building of ships to fill the emergency needs of a country at war. And though he had never built ships before, he concentrated on his job so effectively that he amazed the entire shipbuilding industry by his speed and efficiency, excelling, as he did, the efforts of men who had been engaged in shipbuilding all of their lives. Last but not least, the Nazarene concentrated upon the task of teaching men how to live with one another in peace and harmony. And though his efforts have not yet reached their intended climax, his teachings have become the greatest single influence this world has ever known. Concentration on one's major purpose projects a clear picture of that purpose upon the subconscious section of the mind and holds it there until it is taken over by the subconscious and acted upon. Thus we see that prayer may be expressed by concentration on a definite objective by the strictest habits of self-discipline through these factors. Definiteness of purpose, which is the starting point. Imagination, through which the object of one's purpose is illuminated and mirrored in the mind so clearly that its nature cannot be mistaken. The emotion of desire, turned on until it attains the proportion of a burning desire that will not be denied fulfillment. Faith in the attainment of the purpose, attained by a belief in the realization which is so strong that one can see himself already in possession of it. The full force of the willpower applied continuously in support of faith. The subconscious section of the mind picks up the picture thus conveyed to it and carries it out to its logical conclusion by whatever means that may be available according to the nature of the purpose. These are some of the factors which enter into the principle of concentration and they embrace the procedure followed in all prayers that produce positive results. If any of these factors is missing in prayer, the results are apt to be negative and therefore disappointing. Effective concentration requires that one's attention be fully controlled and directed to a definite objective. Controlled attention is the act of coordinating all the faculties of the mind and can be attained only by the strictest sort of self-discipline. As a matter of fact, one cannot control the attention and direct it to a given end without the supporting influence of well-developed habits of thought, and these are attainable only by self-discipline. Therefore, it is obvious that all the previously mentioned principles of this philosophy blend with and become a part of the principle of concentration. If you have mastered those principles described previously and you have followed all the instructions given, you are now ready to take complete charge of your mind power and you may direct it to whatever ends you desire with reasonable assurance that you will not fail. That is controlled attention. It is not the burden of this philosophy to suggest to anyone the nature or purpose of that which he should desire. The Creator reserved no such prerogative as this, but He provided every person with the privilege of directing his thoughts and desires to ends of his own choice. Therefore, reason and common sense impel us to follow that example. However, we can state with emphasis, born of a great deal of faith, that controlled attention places one in the way of attaining the master key to the power of the mind that it may help one to take full and complete control of his mind, that it is a scientific method of contacting and drawing upon the great reservoir of infinite intelligence for the supply of all human needs. We believe in these truths because we have seen them demonstrated under a great variety of circumstances, embracing almost every type of human progress. You can harness the power of controlled attention if you know precisely what you desire to attain. Then saturate your mind with it. You need to give this desire precedence over all other thoughts. Bring it to mind repeatedly by mastermind discussions and your own individual thinking. If you use controlled attention, you can impress your desires and purposes on your subconscious mind, where they will become part of your character. You must take possession of your mind and direct it toward the attainment of your definite major purpose or your mind will take possession of you and give you whatever the circumstances of life hand out. If you want true success in your life, 
you are well on the way to achieving it. Remember to listen frequently to these recordings. It's inevitable that with each exposure, you'll find a new insight or understanding. And it's these flashes of insight that can lead to greatness. We'll close our program with a prayer that helped Napoleon Hill through many challenges and a tip about remaining energetic and youthful. I remain young by keeping busy in a labor of love and by the habit of celebrating every birthday by taking off a year from my age instead of adding one. And I'm now back in my late 30s. But perhaps to speak more seriously, I close each day's labor with a prayer which keeps my store of blessings eternally filled. And I shall express that prayer now. O oh, infinite intelligence, I ask not for more riches, but for more wisdom with which to make better use of the blessings with which I was endowed at birth through the privilege of embracing my own mind and directing it to ends of my own choice. Amen. <laughs>